Good afternoon, everyone. Please have a seat. We're going to be starting shortly. Shh, everyone, please find a seat. We are going to be starting shortly. And please put all cell phones on vibrate or silence. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Finance Committee hearing where we, where we will be adopting the fiscal 2019 budget. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum and I chair the committee. We've been joined by my colleagues, Councilmember Francisco Moya, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Councilmember Steve Matteo, Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember and, and chair of the subcommittee, uh, Vanessa Gibson, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Councilmember Robert Cornegie, Councilmember Adrian Adams and Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. And um, we may be joined by others, I'm not sure, but we will uh, continue to move on and announce as they come. Today, the Finance Committee will take the necessary actions to allow the City Council to adopt the fiscal 2019 budget, which totals approximately $89.2 billion. In total, this committee will vote on 12 budget related items. In addition, we will also be voting on four LU items. But before we get started, there's a long list of people that need to be thanked for getting us here today. First, I need to thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for leading us through budget negotiations. What really came through this year is that the speaker wanted the process to be inclusive for every council member to feel engaged and part of the budget, and that he wanted the body to speak in a unified voice. I think he achieved all of that, and the fiscal 2019 budget is better for it. With Corey Johnson at the helm, the Council realized some amazing victories, and that is why we can pass a budget today that we can all be proud of. Of course, I also want to thank the, Ch the Speaker's Chief of Staff, Ramon Martinez, for all that he does for the Council and for each and every one of us. Thank you to my fellow Finance Committee members for being part of my first budget as Finance Chair. Together at the executive budget hearings, we spent over 60 hours together listening to testimony from dozens of agencies about how the budget proposed by the mayor affected their ability to perform their core services. On the last day of executive budget hearings, we also heard from over 80 members of the public about how the executive budget affected them. We shared what we learned through the budget hearings with our colleagues in BNT, in delegations, and with each other, and work together to have our voices heard. So thank you, Finance Committee members, for being partners and integral par participants with me during this budget cycle. I must also thank our talented and dedicated finance staff under the leadership of Finance Director Latanya McKenney. Latanya is a seasoned, effective, and skilled negotiator, and we couldn't have done this without her. Thank you, Latanya, for your excellent work. I also want to thank the staff of the Finance Division individually. Everyone played an important role, and I thank you for all the hours you worked around the clock, being responsive to council members' questions and requests for information, and guiding us through delegations and BNT. I'd like to thank Deputy Director and Chief Economist Raymond Majewski, Deputy Director Regina Pareda Ryan, Deputy Director Nathan Toth, Deputy Director Paul Simone, Assistant Director Emra Eddev, Supervising Economist Paul Strump, Committee Counsel Rebecca Chasen, the Unit Heads Isha Wright, Shima Obacheri, John Russell, Russell uh, Doheny Sampora, and Krillian Francisco, the Finance Analyst and Economist Aliyah Ali, Sebastian Bacci, John Basile, Savannah Chow, Raymond Furlong, Sarah Gestelbaum, Hector German, Kenny Grace, Zach Harris, Elizabeth Hoffman, Daniel Krupp, William Cheramateng, Jin Lee, Kira McDonald, Jeanette Merrill, Namira Nuzhat, Caitlin O'Hagan, Jimmy Reyes, John Seltzer, Kendall Stevenson, Andrew Wilbur, Stephen Williams, and Davis Winslow, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Roberta Col uh, Catarano, who pull everything together. Next, I want to thank my staff, Carolyn Tran, Sebastian McGuire, Michael Mallon, and especially Evia Cardoso. I also want to thank everyone in my district office who kept everything going while I was spending a lot of my time down here at City Hall, 
So thank you also to Jacqueline Cosme and Keevan Yee. Lastly, I want to thank Chuck Davis and the Appointments and Investigations Team for vetting every organization receiving discretionary funding. It is a lot of work in a short amount of time, and we, we appreciate all that you do and all that your team does. Thank you to Francesca Della Vecchia, Alicia Vassell, and our Ethics Counsel in the General Counsel's Office, Patrick Bradford, who assisted us with our disclosures. Thank you all. Now, with all that said, let's adopt this budget. The f <laughs> yes. All right, the fiscal 2019 adopted budget includes many significant wins for the council and, most importantly, for the people of New York City. When the executive budget was released, and so a few of the council's priorities were and so few of the council's priorities were included, there were many of us who were uncertain about how much influence the council would have on this year's adopted budget. However, after very successful negotiations, it is absolutely clear that the adopted budget reflects the Council's great impact and our emphasis on protecting the social safety net while pushing for accountability measures that will protect our budget stability in the long term. This year, we targeted our priorities at several large-scale programs that we wanted to see included in the budget, in addition to the agency-specific improvements and, enhance and enhancements that we advocated for. And the result is a negotiated budget that includes the Council's signature proposals, much needed capital funding and capital budget reform, and significant investments in the city's reserves. First and foremost, I must highlight the launch of our Fair Fares, the program to make nearly 800,000 New Yorkers living at or above the poverty line and 12,000 veterans enrolled in city colleges eligible for a half-price Metro card. No longer will anyone have to choose between a meal and a metro card or beg for swipes at the turnstile. This transformative program will save participants over $700 a year, a huge sum for low-income New Yorkers. In addition, as a former teacher and former chair of the Education Committee, I cannot be more proud of the Council's advocacy on behalf of the city's school children. As a result of our efforts, the budget will include $125 million in funding that will go directly into school budgets, $150 million in capital funding to make schools more accessible for disabled children and any disabled parents or teachers, and $2 million to make sure that our neediest schools have at least one guidance counselor or social worker on staff. These investments will make a real difference on the learning environments and educational experiences of our students. But these are not the only investments that we made in the city's youth. The Council successfully negotiated for $15 million to restore summer, summer Sonic programs, $10.3 million for the Summer Youth Employment Program to support an additional 5,000 slots for a total of 75,000 jobs in the summer of 2018. $19 million for Work, Learn, Grow, the year-round uh, youth employment program. $16 million for Compass, and $3 million for runaway and homeless youth. These are incredible victories, but this budget really contains something for everyone. Among the other of the Council's priorities that will be included in the budget are a commitment to property tax reform with the creation of a property tax reform commission that will put forward recommendations to make the property tax system simpler, clearer, and fairer. A priority for permanent housing with an agreement from the administration cons to construct more supportive and congregate housing at a faster rate and to construct 1,000 new senior housing units across six new developments. $17.3 million in operating funds for the libraries as well as $60 million in capital funding. $16 million for the district attorney's offices for salary parity and other programmatic incentives. $2 million for LGBT community services. $12.3 million for parks to allow for the employment of an additional 150 parks maintenance workers, a one-week extension of the pool and beach season, and for increased tree stump removal. $12 million to continue the city's adult literacy programs. $1.8 million for the trans equity program 
to support a range of services to help empower the transgender and gender nonconforming community. $20 million for the Emergency Food Assistance Program and $35.4 million for the crisis management system that deploys teams of credible messengers who mediate conflicts on the street and connect high-risk individuals to services. And amazingly, the list goes on. But throughout the negotiations, we were not only focused on where spending could most significantly have a positive impact on New Yorkers' lives and protect the social safety network. An important part of the Council's position was that the City must be better prepared for any economic downturn that may come in the future. Therefore, we also focused on ensuring that the Administration further shored up the reserves. Our persistence paid off. The adopted budget will include an additional $225 million for reserves, with a portion going to fund the Retiree Health Benefits Fund to help reduce a large unfunded liability. And another area where the Council worked diligently to keep the Administration accountable was our focus on capital budget reform. This year, we made meaningful strides towards that goal. Excess appropriations are often a result of the City front-loading the capital commitment plan, which generates unnecessary new appropriations. With large available pro appropriation balances, the Administration can raise, lower, or create new capital projects mid-year without coming to the Council for approval. Better alignment between appropriations and more realistic planned spending in the capital commitment plan ensures the Charter-mandated checks and balances on the City's capital budget are maintained. Responding to the Council's advocacy, the Administration agreed to rescind $5.8 billion in excess appropriations to the adopted budget in consultation with the Council. It redistributed $6.4 billion in planned commitments from fiscal 18 and 19 across fiscal 20 to 22 in the Executive Capital Commitment Plan, and they put in additional and more descriptive budget lines. This meaningful balanced package of spending and accountability measures is a tribute to the unity of this Council and our dedication to the people of New York. We should all be proud of what we have accomplished for fiscal 2019. Before we move on, I'd also like to acknowledge that none of this would have been possible without the Administration's willingness to partner with us and to negotiate in good faith. I'd like to thank and congratulate Melanie Hartzog on her first budget as OMB Director, and I look forward to continuing to work with her over the next few years. Now, with all of that good news laid out, let's discuss the items that the Finance Committee will vote on today, which will actually make these great things a reality. Finance Committee members should have a budget packet that contains all budget-related legislation that must be voted on by the Committee and again by the full Council at the stated meeting. The packet also includes supporting schedules that are not voted on but filed with the Committee as well as other non-budget-related items that are being voted. I want to strongly emphasize that Finance Committee members will be given only one budget packet. So after you vote on the packet items, you must bring your packet and all of its contents to the stated meeting to vote again. Council members who are not on the Finance Committee will be given their budget packets at the stated meeting. A description of all of the items were emailed to you by the Committee Council, Rebecca Chasen, so I will simply list the items that are on the agenda today that require a vote. The first item is Reso A for the fiscal 2019 capital budget, approving the schedule of changes for the capital budget since the executive budget, including council discretionary allocations. The second item is Reso B for the fiscal 2019 capital budget, which is approval of the capital budget as amended by Reso A. The third item is the resolution adopting the fiscal 2019 contract budget. The fourth item is the resolution adopting the fiscal 2019 expense budget. The fifth item is the resolution to approve the fourth annual amendment to the five-year education capital plan. The sixth item is the resolution approving the 45th year of the community development program and the 44th year reallocations. The seventh, eighth, and ninth items 
are the three pop property tax rate fixing resolutions for fiscal 2019. The tenth item is the resolution approving an expense budget modification for fiscal 2018. The eleventh item is the resolution approving a revenue budget modification for fiscal 2018. The twelfth item is a transparency resolution, and the thirteenth through sixteenth items are land use items. The other documents in your packet, which do not require a separate vote, are a list of the terms and conditions adopted for fiscal 2019, Schedule C and other supporting schedules, and the borough president proposed capital changes. As a reminder to members, Schedule C is a schedule of the expense and contract budgets and the appropriations for organizations listed in Schedule C on the expense and contract budgets. Council members will have to sign a disclosure form indicating whether or not a conflict exists with any of the groups listed in Schedule C or Reso A. If any council member has a potential conflict of interest with any of the organizations included, he or she has the opportunity to disclose the conflict at the time of, the, of their vote. If you have not yet signed those disclosure forms, staff from the general counsel's office are available to guide you through the process. So please see one of them before you vote. As a further reminder, please disclose any conflicts you may have with proposed subcontractors that are used by any of the organizations sponsored. These disclosures must be made before the subcontractor can be approved. I will now speak briefly about the four land use items and the transparency resolution. All four land use items will receive property tax exemptions to preserve affordable housing units through the city's HDFC program. They are as follows. Jamie's Place in Councilmember Ayala and Councilmember Perkins districts, which will receive a partial 40-year exemption to preserve 124 units. 215 Audubon Avenue in Councilmember Rodriguez's district, which will receive a partial 36-year exemption, exemption to preserve 46 units. Mount Hope Renaissance in Councilmember Cabrera and Councilmember Gibson's districts, which will receive a full 40-year exemption to preserve 516 units. And 1296 Sheridan Avenue in Councilmember Gibson's district, which will receive a partial 30-year exemption to preserve 59 units. Representatives from HPD are here to answer any questions we may have on the land use items. Next, we have a transparency resolution. This resolution sets forth new changes in the designation of certain organizations receiving local aging and youth discretionary funding, as well as new changes in the designation of certain organizations receiving funding pursuant to certain initiatives in the budget. Organizations appearing in the resolution that have not yet completed the pre-qualification process conducted by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, the Council, or another entity are identified in the attached charts with an asterisk. As with all transparency resolutions, Council members will have to sign a disclosure form. As previously stated, staff from the General Council's Office is available to assist you with any questions or concerns regarding disclosures. Those are all of our items for today. We will now take questions from members, and then I will have uh, uh, Committee Clerk Billy Martin call the roll. Any questions? Okay, we're good, and therefore I'm going to ask um, the clerk to call the roll. William Martin, Committee Clerk, Roll Call Vote Committee on Finance. All items are coupled. Chair Drum. I vote aye. Gibson. Permission to explain my vote? Yes. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to all of my colleagues and to our phenomenal chair, Danny Drum, and your first year serving as finance chair. I want to commend you on an exceptional job well done. And I want to join you in just expressing my ad admiration for the entire finance team led by Latanya McKinney and all of our unit heads and our analysts. But as the chair of the new subcommittee on capital, it's really been an honor working with all of you. We've spent countless hours together here at City Hall, and I've learned so much about the budget process and the victories you talked about, the excess appropriations being rescinded and also stopping the front-loading of capital commitments 